Hi, everyone. If you ever need a reminder of the awesome power of the sun, the Mojave Desert in the southwest US desert state of Nevada is a great place to start. In the summer, the daytime temperature frequently hits 49 degrees centigrade, and stepping outside is literally like walking into a giant furnace. The local flora and fauna arm themselves against this heat. Joshua trees grow tough concave uh, leaves to channel what little water does fall down towards their roots. Desert animals like rattlesnakes and coyotes are nocturnal or crepuscular, meaning they only come out at dawn or dusk to avoid the sun. And then there are the vultures, which cool off by peeing on their own legs. Humans are less well equipped. In the Sonoran Desert, just to the south of here, hundreds of Central American migrants meet their deaths each year, the sun stripping away their body fluids and causing them to overheat. But the sun also creates opportunities. Those Joshua trees, coyotes, rattlesnakes, people, they wouldn't be there without the sun. Plants depend on sunlight for photosynthesis to create, cre to create food. And animals also rely on the sun indirectly because they eat plants or eat animals that eat plants, and the plants need sunlight. Also, the oxygen we're breathing in this room today is another product of sunlight and photosynthesis. You've come here this evening to hear me talk about the sun, but it's also worth considering that without it, none of us would be here at all. Today, you know, our, our ancient ancestors revered the sun as this kind of creator and destroyer of life, and they constructed big monuments to it and particularly paid attention to things like the winter solstice. But today we've, kind of, we've really lost that connection, and a case in point is Las Vegas, which rises out of the Nevada desert as if in defiance. At night, the Las Vegas Strip is reportedly the brightest place on Earth, and actually the brightest source of artificial light on the planet emanates from the tip of the Luxor Resort and Casino, this giant artificial pyramid. It shines this sky beam up into the night sky every night, almost as if it's issuing this direct challenge to our nearest star. Las Vegas, the, the kind of resort owners at Las Vegas almost seem to have set out to shield the city's residents and visitors from the sun. Um, about 15 years ago, actually, when I first came up with the idea for my book, Chasing the Sun, I was covering a conference for New Scientist in Las Vegas. And I'd spent pretty much three days inside a windowless meeting room with a load of forensic scientists, and then my evenings being dragged around casino floors. Um, and by the end of this, all I really wanted to do was sit outside and have a cup of coffee in the sun. It was October, and the sky was beautiful and cloudless. But there was nowhere to sit. Because these, these big resorts are linked one to the next by these kind of underground passages and these underground shopping centers. And so, you know, I found myself there completely giddy with jet lag, just desperate for some sunlight. And I couldn't find anything. And eventually I found myself in this labyrinthine underground mall at Caesar's Palace, surrounded by magnificent um, mock Greco-Roman architecture. And I saw, finally, what I thought might be sunlight up ahead. I kind of got closer and more and more excited. And when I got there, what I saw was this. It was a beautiful but completely artificial sky. And as I kind of slumped, defeated, next to this replica fountain, it just struck me how perverted our relationship with natural light has become in the modern world. The thing is, our biology is set up to work in partnership with the sun and with the 24-hour cycle of light and dark that it presides over. Our ancient ancestors didn't only revere the sun from a spiritual perspective, they recognized that it had effects on our body and it could heal. So the ancient Babylonians and Egyptians realized that if they mashed up plants and herbs and applied them onto the skin and then showed that skin to the sunlight, it was able to heal 
various skin conditions. They also advocated the use of, of sunlight to, to relieve pain. Um, and I think it was Babylonian doctors said lethargics should be laid out in the sunlight for the darkness is gloom. The ancient Romans and Greeks also recognized these healing powers of the sun. They thought that the sun could cure, sunbathing could cure all manner of things from tiredness to obesity to malnutrition, asthma. The ancient Greek doctor Hippocrates, often cited as the founder of the father of modern medicine, also promoted sunbathing, but he also, you know, he realized that everything should be done in moderation. It was actually him who um, described the first case of melanoma, the deadly skin cancer. So we've always had this idea that the sun is this double-edged sword, this creator and destroyer of life. This idea of the sun as a healer was resurrected in the mid-1800s by this woman, Florence Nightingale. She wrote in her notes on nursing that it's the unqualified result of all my experience with the sick that second only to their need for fresh air is their need for light. And that after a close room, what hurts most is a dark room, and it's not only light, but sunlight that they want. A couple of decades after Florence Nightingale wrote this, um, a Danish doctor, Neil Finson, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his discovery that sunlight could heal tuberculosis of the skin, which at the time was this awful condition which caused people's faces to literally be eaten away by this bacterium. Um, sunlight has this direct bactericidal effect. It kills microorganisms, and some hospitals are starting to use UV light UV light now as a way of killing superbugs. But pretty soon people were discovering other healing effects of the sun. Um, by the 1920s, in fact, sunlight was being touted as a cure for pretty much every disease under the sun, um, particularly things like tuberculosis of the bones and the lungs. And here you kind of go, well, how could it be that sunlight is you know, the sunlight isn't penetrating into our lungs or bones, so how could the sunlight be curing these diseases of our inner bones and organs? Well, the answer there is vitamin D. So, um, and actually by this time, scientists have realized that vitamin D could um, prevent rickets, and they, they realized that the thing in sunlight that was enabling this was vitamin D. So we need vitamin D to produce healthy bones and teeth. But our immune cells also use vitamin D. So the reason that sunlight can help cure something like tuberculosis of the lungs is that our immune cells um, in our lungs use vitamin D to start spewing out this antimicrobial peptide called cathelicidin. But of course, too much sun exposure is harmful. Um, we talked about melanoma. UV light creates mutations in our DNA, which left unchecked can lead to cancer. Another reason why sun exposure, or too much sun exposure may lead to cancer is because it suppresses the immune system and the immune system actually plays a powerful role in detecting abnormal cells and destroying them. But then again, there's mounting recognition that these immunosuppressive effects of sunlight might, in moderation at least, be beneficial. So during the 1960s and 70s, Iran was a country that was heavily influenced by Western fashions and culture. If you look at pictures from that time, men were wearing short shirt sleeves, women were pictured in bikinis and swimsuits. And then with the Iranian revolution of 1979, <clears throat> um, suddenly all that skin was covered up. And women, were told, women in particular were encouraged to dress conservatively and cover their skin. And then between the years of 18, 1989 and 2006, there was an eightfold increase in reported cases of multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease, where the immune cells start to attack the myelin coat that wraps around our nerve cells and speeds up the transmission of their impulses. Multiple sclerosis is an interesting disease as well in the fact that it's, it's more prevalent the further you travel from the equator. So in fact, for every 10 degrees north you travel, the average onset of multiple sclerosis is 10 months earlier. 
it's also more prevalent among people who um, were exposed to low levels of sunlight during their youth or adolescence, or actually in utero, there's evidence that um, women who were not exposed to much sun, um, their children have a higher risk of multiple sclerosis. So what could it be? Well, for a long time, people thought maybe it was vitamin D. <clears throat> um, but, and, and there have been a lot of trials ongoing looking at whether giving vitamin D supplements to pregnant women or to people with the early stages of MS, um, whether it might slow their progression or prevent the disease from developing. But the, so far, those results from those trials have been disappointing. So researchers are now starting to ask whether it's this immunosuppressant effect of, of UV light and sunlight that might actually be protective and whether our immune systems might actually have evolved in harmony with, with some sunlight and that that may be kind of tweaking our immune systems in a, in a positive way. Because it turns out our, our skin cells, our keratinocytes, are covered in these UV receptors. And they actually, we, we think of the skin, you know, the skin is our largest organ and we think of it as a kind of a barrier and a protector from the outside world. But we're increasingly realizing that actually it's a very active organ and it's in a constant dialogue with our immune systems. So when these UV receptors on our, on our skin cells are activated, those skin cells start to talk to our immune systems and trigger the development of these regulatory cells, which dampen down overactive autoimmune reactions. The sun does other things as well. Um, so another disease which has a strong latitude association is heart disease. And again, the further north you travel, the higher the incidence of heart disease. Some of that might be because of the kind of richer countries being further north and, and lifestyle factors. And it's true that, you know, multiple sclerosis too is going to be a combination of genetic and environmental factors. It's not just about the sun. Um, but then again, um, doctors have long noticed that people's blood pressure tends to be lower in the summer than in winter. And recently, a, a, a dermatologist based at the University of Edinburgh called Richard Weller discovered that actually when our skin is exposed to sunlight, we, we release this substance called nitric oxide. And in fact, we have vast stockpiles of this substance in our skin that's sun-triggered. And what nitric oxide does it is it acts as a vasodilator, so it causes our blood vessels to, to widen and relax. And that leads to a drop in blood pressure. So in fact, what Richard Weller has shown is that exposure to 20 minutes, well, the equivalent of 20 minutes of British summer sunlight, causes a clinically significant drop in blood pressure, which continues for about an hour after you step indoors. There's one other thing that the sun does that has a massive impact on both our mind and body, and it's what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of, the t rest of this talk. So at the, back of the, at the back of the eye, just behind the rod and cone cells that enable us to see, are another subset of related cells. They've got a very long name, and I'm only going to say it once. They're called intrinsically photoreceptive retinal ganglion cells, which is why I'm only saying it once. From now on, I'm going to call them light-responsive cells. But what I'm talking about are these, these cells at the back of the eye that don't enable us to see, but they have a really important function nonetheless, and they are responsive to bright light, but particularly light in the blue part of the spectrum. So a lot of you may have heard kind of talk about the kind of downside of blue light and how we need to cut out blue light from our phones. That's blue spectrum light. But we also get a lot of this kind of light in, you know, these bright white lights that are shining on me now. They contain a lot of blue spectrum light. And so does daylight, which will be important in a minute. What these light responsive cells do is they connect to several areas of the brain. They connect to areas of the brain that promote alertness. And studies, study, a study actually showed that being exposed to about an hour of relatively low-intensity blue-spectrum light causes a boost in alertness, which is equivalent to drinking several cups of coffee. Um, that's obviously, that can be a good thing in the daytime, but it's not, at night, it's not necessarily what you want. Those cells also feed into areas of the brain that regulate mood. We know that bright light first thing in the morning is an effective treatment for seasonal affective disorder, but it's also an effective treatment for general depression as well. And these light responsive cells also connect with a really tiny patch of brain tissue about the size of a grain of rice. 
It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the, bra or the brain's master clock. And what this patch of tissue does is it speaks to all these minute molecular clocks in all our body cells, which control these things called circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are these 24-hour fluctuations in the activity of pretty much every biological process, from, from our blood pressure, which varies throughout the day, to our body temperature, to our grip strength, to our brain chemistry, all sorts of things. I mean, even our flexibility. A fact I learned yesterday was that our, our flexibility, so if you kind of reach down and touch your toes, in the evening, you'll be able to get about 15 centimeters lower than if you try the same thing first, in, first thing in the morning. Um, our immune systems as well. Uh, there was a recent study which showed that if you give people a seasonal flu vaccine, they'll produce four times more protective antibodies if that vaccine is given to people at 10 in the morning compared to at 4 p.m. Actually, these clocks in, our, in all our tissues don't run at exactly 24 hours. In some people, they run at closer to 23 hours. In others, it's closer to 25 hours. And yet, all of us somehow manage to stay synchronized with the time of day outside. I mean, sleep is another thing, a big thing that's regulated by our circadian rhythms. And we all more or less wake up at the same time and go to wake up at the same time each day. So how do we stay synchronized when our internal clocks are not quite 24 hours? Well, the answer is light. So when light hits the back of our eye and, and hits those light responsive cells, it acts like a kind of reset button on a stopwatch. It tweaks the timing of that master clock in our brain and synchronizes it with what's going on outside. And then that master clock then speaks to all those other clocks around the body and keeps them in time, both with the time of day outside and with each other. The timing of when we see light also affects the timing of these clocks. So if you see light at night, what happens is it shifts those clocks later, so we become more night owlish. And if we see light first thing in the morning, soon after waking up, it pushes the, in the opposite direction, so we become more larkish. And actually, you know, you see this as the spring advances into summer. Um, you may notice, especially if you don't have blackout blinds, that you start to wake up earlier and earlier and earlier. And that's because of this mechanism. The, the light is pulling your clock earlier and making you more larkish. It's also how we adapt to new time zones when we go abroad and we see light later or earlier. At least that's how it's supposed to work. You know, for most of human history, the timing of our light exposure was pretty consistent. The sun rose and it set. And prior to the, you know, prior to the early 1800s, that's what people experienced. They experienced the night, the old way, when the only source of light after dusk was firelight, or tallow candles, or whale oil lamps. Um, and these things were relatively expensive. So for many people, when the sun set, it became quite dark. In the early 1800s, gas lights were invented, and these quickly spread across the country and across the world. In 1852, nightlife became a thing. Um, before 1852, it wasn't a word, it wasn't a thing, because it was dark in the evenings. Um, and now suddenly you had these gas lights and people could go window shopping, they could go to the theatre, they could go to cafes, and they could stay up later. But then this man came along, and in 1879, he changed things even more. This is Thomas, and e Thomas Edison, the inventor of the electric light bulb. Edison once boasted that, you know, everything which decreases the sum total of man's sleep increases the sum total of man's capabilities. There's really no reason why anyone should go to bed at all. Edison also liked to quip that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Edison may have been a genius, but on the subject of sleep, he was wrong. Because sleep deprivation is deadly, and it can kill us quickly or slowly. 20% of accidents on British roads are sleep-related. 
driving, for four to, driving on four to five hours sleep quadruples your risk of crashing compared to if you've had seven hours sleep per night. But chronic sleep deprivation, that's not getting enough sleep year in, year out, is also deadly. It's been found to precede the onset of all sorts of chronic diseases from Alzheimer's disease, cancer, psychiatric disease. It's associated with cancer, heart disease, obesity, diabetes. I fear I might have repeated myself there. It's not just disease. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also unethical behavior. So um, there was a nice study recently which showed that people who routinely get less than six hours sleep per night are more likely to demonstrate unethical behavior in the workplace. So this is things like falsifying receipts or being mean or abusive even to fellow colleagues or subordinates. <clears throat> and you also see this with the clock change in spring when people, you know, people just lose an hour of sleep when the clocks um, go an hour earlier. And on the Monday after that, I think it's the same researchers have shown that there's this sudden increase in people browsing entertainment websites. I think they found a 6% increase in this thing they call cyber loafing, which is basically sitting on YouTube looking at videos of cute kittens and that kind of thing. So not only was Thomas Edison wrong about our need to sleep, his invention actively undermines it. Um, So there have been various studies now suggesting that people living in areas with greater light pollution have worse sleep. They get less sleep, but they also have poorer quality sleep. Why is that? Well, light suppresses the release of melatonin, which is this hormone we release at night under the control of the circadian, under the control of the circadian clock, and it tells our bodies that it's nighttime, and they should be doing stuff they do at night, like sleeping. It's also alerting in its own right, as I've said. It's, you know, it's a brain stimulant. It wakes us up. So when we see light, bright light at night, and particularly blue light at night, it, um, it suppresses those natural signals which are telling our body to go to sleep. It also pushes our body clock later, so we become more owlish, which is fine if you can choose when you want to get up the next morning, but most of us can't. We have to go to work or school, and so we cut short our sleep. But daylight is also important. So when we have, um, excuse me, when we have a really clear, clear and defined difference between light and dark and day and night, you see our circadian rhythms are really, really sharp and, and healthy and, and pronounced. And you often see in hospital patients, actually, where, where they can't get outdoors, where the lights are switched on all night, you see this flattening of the circadian rhythm and this desynchronization, this disruption. And that's been associated with slower recovery from illness. Now, daylight is an issue because we're now spending 90% of our lives indoors, where it is an order of magnitude dimmer than it is outside. The way we measure Illuminance or brightness is with this unit called lux, which refers to the amount of light striking off a flat surface like the back of the eye. So these pictures were taken in our local park in winter. In fact, on the way to school in winter. Um, you can see facing into the sun, it's almost 30,000 lux outside. And with my back to the sun, this is quite, you know, this is like nine in the morning. It's about 11,000 lux outside. On a, bright, on a bright, cloudless day in summer, it might be as bright as 100,000 lux outside. And even on a cloudy day um, in winter, it's about 5,000 lux at midday. This is a picture um, taken in my friend's back garden just before sunset in summer. Just before sunset, it's about 5, 000, uh, 500 lux outside. Let's contrast that with our indoor light levels. So the first picture here is in the Gibbs building at the Wellcome Trust. It's this kind of really beautiful glass-fronted atrium. But you step a few meters away from that glass and it drops to about 191 lux. The next picture is a hotel room with the curtains open and my back to the window kind of facing into the room, 90 lux. 
The next picture is um, the same hotel room with the curtains drawn, sort of 71 Lux, which is kind of typical for a, a living room. Earlier today, I took a light meter reading in this conference hall. In the daytime, it was 30 Lux. So you know what we're doing, sorry, what we're doing is we're, we're basically spending our lives, our daytimes, in the biological equivalent of twilight, and then we're lighting up our evenings in a way that our ancestors never did. So what would happen if we reverted to a more traditional relationship with light? A few years ago, I decided to find out. So I joined forces with some researchers at the University of Surrey to do an experiment which would see me going cold turkey on light after dusk, and also trying to get more daylight in the daytime by doing things, simple things like eating my breakfast outdoors, even though it was the middle of winter, um, swapping indoor exercise for the outdoor equivalent, in this case, Pilates. Um, and, you know, doing things like going for a walk around the block at lunchtime, um, little things like that, cycling to work. And then in the evenings, after 6 p.m., the electric lights went out and I subjected my poor family to living with candles. Um, and what we found was really interesting because... Well, we, well we, we measured it in a few ways. So I wore a light sensor. Excuse me. I wore a light sensor on my wrist, which was also, wrist, which was also measuring my activity, which we used to kind of measure when I was falling asleep and waking up. We also, um, once a week, I would spit into a tube multiple times to get a measure of when my body was starting to release this substance, melatonin. Um, which gives you a really good indication of what time your internal clock says it is. And we were also, I also had to keep these really regular and consistent mood, sleep, and alertness diaries. So every time, just before I went to bed and just when I woke up the next day, I'd have to fill in these questionnaires about how alert I was feeling, what my mood was like, um, when I went to sleep, and so on. <clears throat> and what we found maybe unsurprisingly, is that when I got rid of the artificial light at night, my body clock shifted between one and a half and two hours earlier. But we saw the same thing, actually, on a week where I didn't worry too much about my evening light exposure, but I just concentrated on getting out more in the daytime. And when I combined both these things, so tried to get out more in the daytime and um, cut out the artificial light at night, the effect was even greater, so I was two hours more larkish than the rest of the time. I also felt a lot sleepier in the evenings. I would have gone to bed a lot earlier than I did, but it was in the run-up to Christmas. And we had a lot of nosy friends and relatives who wanted to see what it was actually like to live without light in the evening. It has good and bad sides. Um, it's, it's really lovely to live by candles. It, you know, conversations feel more intimate. People who came over said it just feels really relaxed and lovely. My daughter said the same thing. Um, but, you know, try cutting an onion or carrot by candlelight. It's, it's, it's tricky. And in fact, we undercooked our friend's beef burgers on New Year's Eve because we couldn't see what color they were. Um, but there were other things. So I also realized that when I was waking up in the morning, rather than having that kind of groggy sleep inertia, when I woke up, and I was actually waking up before my alarm clock went off, um, I was awake and re raring to go and feeling more positive. And actually, a similar thing has been seen in other larger and far better controlled studies as well. <clears throat> the General Services Administration is basically the, the largest landlord in the US. It's in charge of all the government buildings and offices. And they were really interested in what would happen if they got more daylight into their offices. Um, so they did this study and they fitted these office workers with these light meters and then kind of monitored their sleep and their mood. And, and they, they compared different buildings. So some buildings had lots of windows and lots of lights. Other buildings had very little light. They were quite gloomy. And what they found was... Um, Actually, that the people, who were, the people who had the kind of highest daytime light exposure, they found 
They were taking less time to fall asleep at night, and they were also sleeping for longer. And the effect was greatest for the people who were seeing a lot of bright light in the morning. Um, so for these people, actually, it was taking 18 minutes to fall asleep at night on average, compared to 45 minutes in the group who were seeing the least light in the mornings. And they were also sleeping for 20 minutes longer per night on average. The other thing they saw was um, that greater daylight exposure was associated with lower scores of depression. So, you know, really all of us should be trying to brighten our days and dim our nights, I think. But what if you can't because you're in a care home or a hospital? Well, here, I think artificial light can help. A number of hospitals have been trialing what they call circadian lighting, which is basically artificial lighting which tries to mimic what's going on in the natural world outside. So you have these bright white lights during the daytime, and then as evening progresses, you switch to orange dimmer lights. And in this small study at a hospital in Denmark, uh, in Copenhagen, what they found in the stroke rehabilitation ward was that in the patients housed in the wing of the ward where they had this circadian lighting, they had more robust circadian rhythms, so these sharper, more pronounced circadian rhythms. Um, a common side effect of having a stroke is depression and fatigue or tiredness. And what they found in the patients in these, in these circadian lit wards was that they had reduced symptoms of fatigue and depression. The doctor I interviewed said the effect was comparable to giving antidepress antidepressants. And a nurse said that she had noticed that the effect was most pronounced in dementia patients. And she said they just seem to have this better idea about what time of day it is which is interesting because this kind of circadian lighting is also being piloted in care homes and especially places where people with dementia are being kept. So generally our circadian rhythms become flattened as we get older and the lenses in our eyes become kind of cloudier. So you need, actually you become less sensitive to the effects of light at night as you get older, but also less sensitive to the effects of light in the daytime. And what researchers have found is that these, these things that you get with dementia, you get this thing called sundowning, where patients become kind of agitated and confused in the late afternoon going into the evening. And you also get this, this kind of night waking, where people wake up in the night, they're very confused, quite often you get falls. And actually, this is a major reason why people with dementia end up in care homes, because their relatives just can't handle the night waking and the, and the risk of falling. Interestingly, these things seem to be worse during the winter when there's less daylight available, and on cloudy days in winter especially. So, um, so a, number of research, a number of different research groups have now looked at the effect of trying to boost light exposure during the daytime. They're also doing it in, um, in Parkinson's disease with, with quite promising results. And what they're finding is that in this study, it was about a three and a half year trial, and they were comparing care homes where they'd fitted bright lights in the kind of communal areas, which were just on during the daytime. And they found that in the care homes where they had these bright daylights, there was less um, cognitive deterioration. So people's dementia was getting worse a bit more slowly. It definitely wasn't a cure for dementia, but it, but it seemed to be it seemed to be a kind of slower decline. Um, they had fewer symptoms, symptoms of depression and less deterioration in their ability to do everyday things like dress themselves. Um, and when they gave melatonin, which you can, you can give artificially as a tablet, and that again kind of increases this signal that the night is coming, they found that it improved the patient's sleep. So in conclusion then, what I really think we need is you know, we need to be trying to brighten our daytimes and dim our night times. That doesn't mean we have to bake ourselves in the hot summer sun and give ourselves sunburn and increase our risk of skin cancer, but I think we do need to pay much more attention to our light exposure. And the other thing is to try to keep a regular schedule. So, you know, when we see light at night and at different times, our body clocks will move but they don't all move at the same rate. So you get this kind of spreading desynchronization through the body where 
you know, the clock in the brain falls out of synchrony with the clock in the heart and the clock in the liver is somewhere else. And if you think about, you know, the way I like to think of it is as a kind of a factory production line, like imagine a kind of cake factory. So, you know, you get a really good cake if, if things proceed in an exact and specific order with very exact amounts of, of ingredients. And if the kind of, if that all breaks down and things start to happen in a more disordered order, you might end up with rather than a cake, like a glacé cherry crumble with a fried egg on top. So, you know, we need to try and keep a regular schedule and just pay more attention to our light environment. Thank you.